Hello once again class and welcome to another mock lecture. Today we're going to be tackling verifying identities, which is actually not that dissimilar to what we were just talking about in the last video. So first, let's just go through some cool algebra stuff. Now we actually already talked about expanding something like sine x plus cosine x quantity squared, where you got to use the box method or the FOIL method, you know, to figure out what's going on here. And the cool thing is that um, after you do that, right, because essentially it's just a plus B quantity squared, which is A squared plus 2AB plus B squared. Uh, you get to go this additional step where you get to turn sine squared X plus cosine squared X equal to one because that's a Pythagorean identity, okay? But let's say that we wanted to also do something like factor. Well, because we can expand, right? We could factor in a similar way. What you could do is you could think about sine of X as a variable, you can call it A. So this is basically a squared plus 8a plus 15. The leading coefficient here is 1, so we're just looking for two factors of 15 that are going to add to give us 8. So this is kind of on the easier end of factoring because there are two factors that multiply together to give you 15 and add to give you 8. It's 5 and 3. So you get a plus 5 and a plus 3. You just have to remember that, well, wait a minute, a is the sine of x. So you have sine of x plus 5 and sine of x plus 3. Now you might wonder, where is this useful? Well, think about if you had some expression like sine of x squared plus 8x uh, plus 8 sine of x plus 15 over the sine of x plus 3, this can be simplified, right? The numerator can be factored into this thing. And then the co there's a commonality, right? There's a common factor in the numerator and the denominator. So this expression, which looks pretty complicated, actually just simplifies itself to the sine of x plus 5. The other thing that we can talk about are conjugates. Now, a little bit of a recap on what is a conjugate. If you have the sum of two expressions, like a and b, the conjugate of a plus b is a minus b. So algebraically, it's defined to be the sum. Conjugates usually come in pairs, right? So it's the sum and difference of the same two terms. Um, that's a conjugate. And the cool thing is when you multiply conjugates together, you get typically you get a difference of the squares of those expressions. So a plus b times a minus b is actually equal to a squared minus b squared. And you can check this by using FOIL or using the box method yourself, but it's true. You get a difference of squares when you multiply conjugates together. Now, anytime that you have the square of some trig function, that automatically for me triggers, oh, maybe there's Pythagorean stuff that's involved, right? So whenever I have like a sine squared or a cosine squared, a tangent squared, co cotangent squared, you know, whatever it is, I think about these Pythagorean identities and I, and I say to myself, well, if I can somehow get one of these by, by multiplying a conjugate, then I could potentially simplify the expression that, uh, that I'm trying to simplify. So for example, if I have one over tangent of x minus secant of x, let's say I want to turn this into something that looks different. Well, I could multiply by the conjugate of the denominator, which is tangent of x minus secant of x. Now, it's a fraction, so whatever I multiply the bottom by, I have to multiply the top by that same thing, because basically this is just the number one. It's something divided by itself. So I'm not changing the integrity of this fraction, right? I'm simply just changing the way that it looks. Well, the cool thing is when you multiply by tangent of x plus secant of x, it generates a difference of squares of these two trig functions in the denominator. And tangent squared x minus secant squared x is just negative one, right? I'm going to switch the location of these two things so that I can generate a tangent of uh, tangent squared x minus a secant squared of x. And moving the one to the other side makes it so that you're, you're setting this equal to negative one. So the whole denominator here is just negative one, which means that this thing just simplifies, and that's by Pythagorean identity, to negative tangent x minus secant x, which could be easier to work with than one over than some you know kind of rational looking thing so let's do some verifying let's do some examples basically verifying an, an identity is almost a directed simplification so in in the last video we were talking about simplifying things but i think you know when you say okay simplify this that's a very subjective thing like you someone might say well to me the addition of two trig terms or two trig functions is pretty simple. And someone else might say, oh, I prefer the multiplication of two trig functions. Well, the cool thing about verifying identities is that you actually know what you're trying to make the thing simplify into, okay? So, but basically it's, it's um, verifying identities is a logical explanation that shows why 
two expressions are equal or, or shows how two expressions are equal. So it follows a very specific format. So you might claim that some expression A is equal to some expression B, and your job now is to prove that. So the way that I typically do proof outlines is I put all my kind of logic and reasoning stuff on this side, right? So this is all of my mathematics. This is like the actual math. And then over here is is the justifications, right? So how do we, why am I able to, like, why am I able to say this scribble? Well, it's because of this, right? Why am I able to say this? Oh, that's because of this. Why am I able to say these two things? Oh, that's just basic, basic algebra, right? So that's kind of like the idea behind this, this kind of two column proof outline. And in trigonometry, most of the justifications are gonna come either from algebra or from citing some known identities like a Pythagorean identity or a quotient identity or a reciprocal identity or a double angle identity later on down the road, you know, or, or the law of signs or, you know, something like that. And at the very end, you, you can say, well, look, now I've proved that this is equal to this because of all this stuff. So therefore A is equal to B, and then you get to put a little, I put a little, usually I call it a black square because you're usually writing it in like pencil or you're typing it out and it shows up as a black square. Here it's a yellow square, but it just represents the end of the proof outline. Okay, some people write QED or something like that, but that serves a similar purpose. Okay, example one. So we want to, so this is what I'm talking about. Show that this is equal to this, right? We have some direction. It's not just simplify this, right? And then this is like gone. Right, no, it's it's actually show these two things are true, uh, or rather show that these two things are equal. So I'm gonna first, I'm gonna start off, that's the claim. Okay, we're, we're claiming that this is equal to this. We haven't shown it yet, right? We're just saying that this is true. So when we are going to go prove this thing, you gotta pick a side to start with. Basically, you're picking a side to start with and then you're gonna manipulate it enough until it looks like the other side, right? Depending, on, and you have a choice. You can pick whatever side you want. I recommend choosing the side you feel is more complicated because then it really is like a simplifying. It's harder to start with something that's simple and then make it look complicated. So I typically like to start with the side that is most complicated and then I think about how can I simplify this. Um, in this problem, both sides look almost the same level of complexity. So I'm just gonna start with the left-hand side. Oh, and by the way, so you can't just start here and then just start doing stuff to this, right? You can't just be like, well, okay, I'm going to go ahead and cross multiply. So then we have sine squared of X is equal to one, you know, minus cosine squared of T, right? Oh, that's a Pythagorean identity. So they're, they're, we're done. We must, must be, must be equal. Um, that is assuming what you're already trying to prove. Right? You can't say, here's the claim, and then start with this, and then be like, okay, so now let's just start manipulating both sides, because then you're starting with this is equal to this. We're trying to show they're equal, right? So you have to pick a side and, and start with that. So you cannot assume what you're trying to prove. I used to have this proofs professor in college that said, look, assuming what you're trying to prove, that's the unpardonable sin in a math class. Can't do that. Can't assume what you're trying to prove. So I'm not going to do that. Right, I'm gonna start with the left-hand side. So I'm gonna start with the sine of t over one minus cosine t. And I just have to think about how could I get it to look like this? So in my mind, I'm like, well, okay, I need a one plus cosine t in the numerator. That happens to be the conjugate of one minus cosine t. So I think I'm gonna start off by multiplying both sides by the one minus the cosine of t. And the other thing to keep in mind, and, and, and you know, the reason I was like, well, I need a one plus cosine t in the numerator. Um, that same proofs professor told me, always keep your eyes on the prize, which is to say, remember what you're trying to get, right? Remember where you're trying to get to, or where you're trying, where you're headed. I need to have a one plus cosine t in the numerator, and I recognize that as the conjugate of one minus cosine t. And that's why I think it seems reasonable to multiply the top and bottom of this equation by one plus cosine of t. Okay, so that's what I did. In the denominator, that gives us a difference of squares. One squared is just one. You have one minus cosine squared of t. And I'm gonna justify. I always have to justify what you're doing. Here, I'm just multiplying by the conjugate. You know, if I wanted to, I could probably justify this with just algebra. I'm not doing anything really, like trigonometry wise, I am simply just unsimplifying this fraction by a factor of one plus cosine t. Got to do it on the top and the bottom. Because again, this is just the number one. 
That right there simplifies to one. Now, uh, you might be tempted to be like, okay, cool, so now we're gonna distribute, right? Well, hold on, not, not quite yet, because down here, that is a thing. That's a thing right there. We gotta do the thing. Um, that's sine squared of t. One minus cosine squared t is sine squared of t by this specific Pythagorean identity. It's a manipulation of this identity, right? Specifically, if you subtract from this identity cosine squared t from both sides, then you'll have sine squared t is equal to one minus cosine squared t. That's how it's sine squared t. But anyway, that's just sine squared t. Uh, and so my justification by Pythagorean identity. Now, if you have like a divided by a squared, right? Or a squared divided by a cubed, you can use an exponent property that says you're just subtracting the exponents, right? This is really a to the first. Um, and so this just becomes one over a, right? This one becomes one over a also. Maybe those weren't the best examples. You know, think about if you have like a to the seventh divided by a to the ninth. Okay, in that case, you'd actually get one over a squared. I don't really know if this is helping. Let's, let's, let's move on. The point is, I'm using algebra. I'm, I'm canceling out a common factor. Really, this is sine t times the sine of t. So I'm canceling out a, a factor of sine t in the numerator and a single factor of sine t in the denominator. So this is just this is just gone now, and then I'm just left with one sine t in the denominator. So we have one plus cosine t over sine t. Well, that's what we're trying to get. We're done. We ended with it, right? We just showed that the sine of t over one minus cosine t. If you start here, you can do some things that are perfectly reasonable and mathematically sound to get to one plus cosine t over sine t. So I'm going to put in my conclusion with my little black square, although it's almost like a pastel yellow square in this particular case okay we're done example two let's show that this thing this difference of two trig functions is equal to the tangent of t times the sine of t okay well again we got to pick a side um i just picked the left side i picked with i uh, picked the difference of uh, these two things so secant theta minus cosine theta is what i'm going to start with and uh, I'm going to get everything in terms of sine and cosine. And that, for me, that's a pretty typical strategy, right? There's like a couple things I have in my mind when I'm going through trigonometric proofs. Number one, let's turn everything in terms of sine and cosine, because we know all the other definitions of the trig functions based solely on sine and cosine. So oftentimes that can help. Um, and then also I'm thinking, is there any way I can get some kind of a squared, um, squared function so that I can use some kind of Pythagorean identity? And let's see, right? Right now, I'm just getting things in terms of sine and cosine. So I, I turned secant theta into one over cosine. Um, and then now I'm going to find a common denominator, right? So I'm going to have to multiply this one by cosine. That's the worst S I've ever drawn over cosine, which actually gives me cosine squared theta divided by cosine theta, which I know you're going to be like, well, let's just simplify that. Well, but if I do that, I just get back to here. Right, so I don't want to simplify. I want to keep moving forward with this thing. Uh, since we found a common denominator, I think it only makes sense to actually combine the numerators. So we have one minus cosine squared theta. Well, by a Pythagorean identity, the same one that we just used in the last example, that is sine squared theta. So we have sine squared theta over cosine theta. Well, sine squared theta over cosine theta is sine theta times sine theta over cosine theta. And so I'm going to break this up with multiplication. So this is the same as sine over cosine, right, of theta, respectively, times sine over 1, right? And that's what I have here. Well, sine over 1 is just sine, and sine theta over cosine theta, that's the tangent function, right? That's tangent theta sine theta. So we arrived right at the conclusion that we wanted. So therefore, secant theta minus cosine theta is equal to the tangent theta sine theta. Now, you might look at this and you might say, well, Mock, actually, I would have rather started with the tangent theta sine theta function. OK, that's totally fine. Right. In fact, honestly, it's probably easier. I think this this common denominator business can actually be a little tricky when you're first starting up. So it actually might be easier to start here. Why don't you go ahead and uh, pause the video? See if you can figure that one out. Start with the, this one. Right. And see if you can end with this. Welcome back. Hopefully you give this a shot. 
You might have realized if you're looking at the last part of the video that it's almost exactly the same proof but backwards. Oftentimes that is the case, right? That's that's uh, the opposite logic is how you could reach there. So starting with tangent theta, sine theta, turning that into sine and cosine, realizing you're multiplying sines together, so that's sine squared theta. Since you have a squared trig function, you can use a Pythagorean identity, break that thing up into two different things. This simplifies here, so you get secant theta because that's one over cosine theta minus the cosine of theta. So again, these things are gonna be equal, okay? So you can use all these identities, right? Here's a recap of all the identities that we know so far. And uh, these are things to look for being able to use right now. As we go through more and more videos, we're gonna continue to add to this list. There's quite a few more trigonometric identities that we're gonna get through. Uh, but right now, this is what we have to work with. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Hopefully you guys learned something. If you have any questions, uh, leave them in the comments below. Thanks a ton for watching. Then I'll see you in the next one.